It, when a pollution gets trapped in our atmosphere, it causes almost a blanket that smothers the earth. Because of that blanket, we now have a dramatic increase in extreme weather, floods, fires, droughts, and lethal heat. L lethal heat alone killed five million people on the planet last year because they had nowhere to go for their bodies to cool down. There were points last year that were so hot, the hottest uh, ever recorded in human history. If we continue to get hotter past 1.5 degrees, that means millions more people will die. That means there'll be a lot less food and food will become more expensive. It means that some areas of the planet will get to be unlivable. And, and so it all comes down to, are we using more fossil fuels or not? and are we producing more or not? And what I realized is that our governments are only constraining emissions, but they're not regulating how much fossil fuels are built. And, and, that, and that's because every government and every country knows we need to use less, but they all want to be the last barrel sold because they're making billions in profits. This is the moment when we need all hands on deck. And, and whether or not you can do it full time or whether you can just do it a couple hours a week. In, in Maui this year, people had to just run and jump into the ocean. So imagine you're just sitting in your apartment and all of a sudden everything's on flames around you. Welcome to the Driving Impact Podcast, where we speak with leading experts about the most pressing topics of our time. We are excited to have you join us as we dig deep into bold innovations and ideas from today's leading scientists, artists, entrepreneurs, and change makers from diverse fields. I am Kathleen Jean-Pierre. Your host will guide you on this journey. Hello, Driving Impact Hive. I'm so excited to welcome our next guest. Her name is Dr. Tsipora Berman, who is the chair of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. She's also the director at Stand.Earth. And she's published a book that's called This Crazy Time Living or Environmental Challenge. She speaks on fossil fuel and climate change throughout the years and has spent the past 30 years creating global change programs and advising a global campaigns for the government. Welcome, Dr. Seppo Raberman, to Driving Impact. And I feel like it's a privilege for us to have you join us and talk about an important topic of our time, which is climate change. Thanks so much for having me. And I wanted to start a little bit by getting to know you, who you were as, as a kid. So when you were growing up as a kid, did you know, how did you know that of what you wanted to do in your career as a climate activist? Were there ever like some chrysalis moments or pivots? Did you know mm. what you wanted to do when you were growing up? You know, I don't think I did. I I think it evolved over time. I I was certainly always interested in in environmental issues, but not. I, I didn't really think of it as a career. And in fact, mm -hmm. coming out of high school, I my first in the first university degree I, pers I pursued was a degree in fashion arts design. Oh wow! And, and I did that for a year and. And then I decided to travel that summer, and that was a pivotal moment for me. I, I traveled to Europe, and this is probably 1991, something around there. And and at that time, there was incredibly bad air pollution in a lot of cities in Europe. It was before some of the newer laws came into place constraining how many cars can go into in, in, into in the city centers, but also before a lot of the vehicle efficiency laws. And so I, I had this dream. I was, loved art history. I loved art and fashion. And I wanted to go see the Acropolis in Greece. And I went to Athens. And Athens that summer was just choked in yellow smog. And and I never forget standing at the top of the Acropolis. And it was before the restoration. So it was literally crumbling from acid in the air. And I looked down and the whole city was just covered in yellow. And when I got back to my hostel that night, I remember I was coughing up like black goo and my face was all black and and I got so I we're I'm very privileged in Canada we have big beautiful country a lot of forests and the air was certainly a lot of I'd never experienced that kind of pollution before mm -hmm. and so my sister and I said okay let's go somewhere natural let's go hiking and we chose this spot in Germany the Hartz Mountains and got we had a Eurail pass got on a train that night woke up we were in Germany 
and we got out and it turns out that forest had been left standing, even though it was dead as a result of acid rain and industrialization as a testimony to what society could do. Mm. And we didn't know. And so we walked through this forest for an entire day through a standing dead forest, not a leaf, not a plant, not a bird, just standing dead trees. And so going from Athens to the standing dead trees, and it was a real pivotal moment for me. And I came back home and I dropped out of fashion arts design and I applied and and joined the environmental studies program. Wow. And when was that? Was it like 20 years ago, 30 years ago? 30, over 30, 30 years, years ago now. So imagine if it was, it looked like that 30 years ago, what does it look like today? Thank you for sharing your story. I feel like that's a major chrysalis moment. And because of mm. this moment that today you're doing the amazing work that you do. So feeling grateful for that moment, even though that's a little bit scary of a picture. I wanted to jump into the topic of today, which is climate strategy. And I wanted to get your perspective on what do you think is missing for the conversation on climate change for us to actually be able to fix the critical point we're in today. And just for you, Dr. Berman, our audience is an audience of normal people who are trying to impact the world, but really navigate uh, climate mm -hmm. change in a very digestible way. You know, I, I spent a long time trying to figure this out because the beginning of my career, I worked on forest conservation and protection of forest and forest policy. And I didn't start working on climate change till about probably about 15, 20 years ago. So I was already a decade into my career before I started working on climate change. And I switched because I realized for me, the entry point or the reckoning moment was that so much of our forest is being destroyed as a result of climate change. And that was what made me start to work on climate change. But it took me years before I really understood how to be effective before I, and I think it was because it, it's been made so complicated. You have to, you yeah. feel like you have to be an expert, you know, you need to know whether it's this emissions reduction by this date and this percentage or these complex policies. And now that I've been doing this for decades, I realize that actually it's not so complicated. This is about whether or not we use and produce more oil, gas, and coal or not. Okay. So a lot of people don't realize that, but 86% of the emissions that are the pollution trapped in our atmosphere, it, when a pollution gets trapped in our atmosphere, it causes almost a blanket that smothers the earth. And when that blanket, because of that blanket, we now have a dramatic increase in extreme weather, floods, fires, droughts, and lethal heat. Lethal heat alone killed 5 million people on the planet last year because they had nowhere to go for their bodies to cool down. Oh my goodness. There were points last year that were so hot, the hottest uh, ever recorded in human history, that there were some places where the government was saying, don't go outside, you'll die if you go outside. We're now at a critical moment on the planet with lethal heat. All of this is happening because of three products, oil, mm -hmm. gas, and coal. So and so and the future of our planet is just dependent on how much oil, gas, and coal we use and whether we continue to produce it. And what I realized is that for decades, our climate policy and the conversation, international agreements, has focused on reducing the demand for fossil fuels, trying mm -hmm. to increase renewable energy, and, and really only about cutting emissions. But meanwhile, the industry keeps increasing new projects, keeps increasing the production of fossil fuels. So even though the science is really clear that we need to cut in half by 2030 our, our, the pollution that we're allowing to get trapped in the atmosphere, yeah. right now we're on track to produce 110% more new oil, gas, and coal projects by 2030 than we can ever use on the surface of the planet, or we'll take the planet way beyond the 1.5 degree goal. And all that really means is that the 1.5 degree goal, if we continue to get hotter past 1.5 degrees, that means millions more people will die. That means there'll be a lot less food and food will become more expensive. It means that some areas of the planet will get to be unlivable. And, and so it all comes down to, are we using more fossil fuels or not? And are we producing more or not? And what I realized is that our governments are only constraining emissions, but they're not regulating how much fossil fuels are built. And, and, that, and that's because every government and every country knows we need to use less, but they all want to be the last barrel sold. 
because they're making billions in profits. And so, so the average person, what we need to do, we need to obviously be careful how we live. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we need to reduce our footprint where we can. But what's even more important is that we ask our elected officials who work for us, the government mm -hmm. works for us, that we, we make sure that they know that we care whether or not they're stopping fossil fuel expansion and increasing the expansion of renewable energy. It's that simple. We have to stop building the bad stuff yeah. and build more of the good stuff. And if you write to your elected official, your member of parliament, or you call mm -hmm. their office, that actually they have a metric that then means way more people. They think way more people care about it. And if they think there's going to be consequences for them, like we'll support them if they do the right thing, or we might not vote for them if they do the wrong thing, mm -hmm. then that's how we get the big systems and law changes that we need. So basically having more people writing and calling their parliament, right? And yeah. petitions also work in terms of taking Absolutely. Action. Petitions work. And, and organizing yourself. Like some people say to me, I love the fossil fuel treaty. It's such a big, bold idea. Mm -hmm. uh, how can I help? And I say to them, make it your own. Like we yeah. have a small core team that is trying to design materials and information, but don't wait for someone else to organize, to organize that march or that protest. Don't wait for someone else to launch a fossil fuel treaty campaign in your city or your country. This is the moment when we need all hands on deck and, and whether or not you can do it full time or whether you can just do it a couple hours a week, yeah. we have to think about what we're doing. And that means not just thinking about what we buy, but also how we're spending our time. I think that's such a powerful statement, Dr. Bourbon. So to summarize it for our audience, a couple of things, actions that we can take, even if you don't have a lot of time, is contacting your elected officials, contacting parliament, calling, emailing, uh, organizing petitions, also organizing marches or any types of movement. And then lastly, what you talked about is also changing our behavior personally in terms of not increasing the consumption of, of oil, gas, and, and fossil, but really even though, even like just stopping like overall our consumption. Well, also those things are embedded in products. So like it's coming up to the holidays, people say to me, well, what am I supposed to be buying? This product or that product, this product or that product. And I always say, use these simple rules. Try not to buy new things. Mm -hmm. Go go to used stores, thrift stores, you know, resale stores, because new products, new clothing, new furniture, they all require new materials that are extracted from the earth and that use energy to produce. So try mm -hmm. first of all, try and, and create a culture where it's okay to buy things at an antique store or a thrift store and give them away. This yeah. is, you know, we have to value what's already, what's already produced. And then also think about what gifts can you give that aren't stuff? We focus on consumption so much in our society. We think of yeah. ourselves as consumers before we think of ourselves as citizens. Yeah. And, and so I've been encouraging, you know, I always encourage my boys, you know, give me a card that tells me how many times you're going to clean the kitchen. Tell me your, you know, offer me some of your time to help me figure out how to get more better playlists on my yeah. music. You know, offer your time to people instead of just stuff. And you can also give a plant, right? To a friend mm. for the holidays. I have a, exactly. my cousin, she always gives us pine cones that she collects or she cooks something and she puts it in a jar and she, she gives it to us. I think that's a very that's lovely. Incentive. So to go back yeah, to I our make jam. Our, Yeah, I love jam. My grandmother used to do amazing uh, tomato jam. I used to live in a forest in, in Montreal. Just It was a forest in the back of where we lived. And we just pick up some berries and then she would do jams. But now if you go back to that place in Montreal, there's, there's it's houses everywhere. So the world yeah. has changed a lot. So what do you think is keeping us from impacting change, right? Because we're at a critical point right now and why are we seeing because you talked about the fact that there's more oil produced because every single government wants to make more money so what else is keeping us from impacting change and turning around the climate urgency where we are in i think that on climate change that the fossil fuel industry the companies who make the most profits they've been quite successful in doing two things one first of all in making us feel guilty because we use fossil fuels You know, the personal carbon footprint calculator, that idea came from BP, an oil company, 20 years ago. 
because they don't want the onus to be on them for creating a product that's killing us. They want it to be on us for using that product. It's almost like the tobacco companies, you know, they didn't want to early in the early days, take responsibility either. Oh, people smoke. We're just providing the cigarettes. Yeah. But if you think about it, it's like a drug dealer saying, oh, well, I just, I just provide the drugs. Because people want it. It's, yeah. And, and so look, we all use fossil fuels today. We do. We still do. Oil, gas, and coal, it's really hard to get away from. And it's especially hard to get away from if you're not privileged with a lot of money. You know, you can mm-hmm. buy a heat pump or buy an electric car. Or, you know, what if you're a single mom and you're living below the poverty line? What are you supposed to do? You know, people say walk to work. Well, if you have very little time between two jobs, you're not walking to work. Mm-hmm. And and so I, what I think, I think that this idea that we should feel guilty and therefore we shouldn't advocate for different systems is a problem. Like I often get people on my social media saying, oh, you flew to Dubai for the cop. Or I bet, what do you still, you know, you drive a car. Yes, we use fossil fuels today because we live in a system that is dependent on fossil fuels. If we're going to live in a system that has cleaner, safer, renewable energy, then our governments need to put in place the systems and laws so that everyone can do that, not just wealthy people. Mm -hmm. And if our governments are going to put in place the laws, then we need to encourage them to do that. And I think that people have almost distanced themselves from advocacy on climate change and renewable energy because they feel guilty they use fossil fuels. And I think we Mm. need to stop that. You know, you don't not advocate for a better medical system because you use the existing one. Of course. We use things and we have to change them. So that's the first thing is I I, I think that we have to stop feeling guilty and just start advocating. Mm -hmm. And then I think the other thing that's been holding us back is that the conversation for too long has just been about emissions. And so it's been about this complicated math and modeling about who's reducing emissions or what by what target. Again, we've made it too complicated. And I think that is also a strategy of the fossil fuel Mm -hmm. industry. And, And in fact, this, when I was, Uh, the climate negotiations that just happened in Dubai, there was a letter, a secret letter that was leaked. And the letter was written by OPEC, the organization that runs the major oil companies, or major oil countries, intervenes on the major oil countries. And OPEC wrote a letter to the governments saying, don't agree to any language about phasing out fossil fuel production, because if you do, there will be irreversible consequences for the future of fossil fuels. Well, there would be. Because renewable yeah, energy is safer and it's cleaner and it and it is available now at scale and it's cheaper. But we're not producing more renewable energy to displace fossil fuels because the fossil fuel industry keeps pressuring governments and trying to push that you can just reduce emissions, but we can keep increasing the production because mm-hmm. the production is where they make the money. And and but it, what we build today will be what you use tomorrow. Yeah. So. Economists would say that we've been trying to address climate change by only cutting with one half of the scissors, the demand and emissions, but not cutting the supply. But the good news is I think that we've kicked open the door to that conversation at COP28 in Dubai last week. And for the first time in 30 years, we're having a conversation about how governments need to constrain and regulate the production of oil, Mm -hmm. gas and coal, of fossil fuels, and not just the emissions. And that's what we have to push our governments on. Don't build more of the bad stuff. We don't want more new oil and coal projects. We want less of them. And we want more cleaner and safer energy efficiency and renewable energy. And and that's what our governments have to do. And we have to encourage them to do it. But if that's going to happen, then more people need to march in the streets. Then more people need to write letters to their governments. Because when you look at the information that's been released by Influence Map, Every day, the oil industry meets with governments thousands of times every day. They have thousands of lobbyists around the world. So our governments are being constantly influenced and lobbied and pushed by the companies who stand the most to benefit from us not acting. So if we're going to balance that out, we need citizens and scientists and teachers and people from all walks of life showing the government that they care and they want them to act and that there's a counterbalance to that big pressure from the fossil fuel companies. I think that's very helpful and insightful. I think, so basically what you said just for our audience is that we have the power to change and to change the supply, 
right? Because it's yeah. not just about the emissions. It's, we have the power to change the supply. And if we change the supply, then it's going to complete the picture of us, right? Protecting our planet and also turning around the climate change trajectory. So where are we in that critical point? Because it's not clear because there's a lot of information you said. Sometimes we feel that you need a PhD to understand climate change. Well, you shouldn't, right? It should be very simple, like one plus one equals two, but it's not. Yeah, so and it's are... really not. Yeah, because I think we're not in a good place. Let me just tell you, we're, we're, I mean, we're in, in some ways, we're in a better place than we were a couple of years ago, because as a result of the Paris Agreement, which was the big breakthrough agreement that was made on climate change, governments have now committed to put in place a lot of policies to reduce emissions and demand, so to decrease pollution. Policies like setting a date for when we'll no longer be allowed to buy fossil fuel cars, where there will mm. the companies can only produce electric yeah. and cleaner cars. And now there are probably somewhere more than 40 countries in the world that have those policies in place. And so when you when you look at what's happening to the demand for oil and fossil fuels, you're seeing that it's it's starting to 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 peak. And it's projected to go down quickly, not just because of electric cars, but also because now there are policies in place in a lot of countries for heat pumps. So mm -hmm. instead of using gas, which comes from fracking and is terribly terrible pollution, to heat our homes, <laughs> we're going to use electricity and heat pumps. That's cheaper, actually, and it's going to save people money, and it's going to mean that we're not using fossil fuels. It all comes back to whether or not we're using fossil fuels or not. And so now we have a bunch of good policies in place. As a result of those policies, we used to be on track for a four to six degree warming on the planet. Now we're on track for a two to three degree warming on the planet. But what people need to understand is what we're experiencing right now on the planet is only a result of about a one degree of warming. And at that one degree level, Five million people died last year just from lethal heat alone because it was too hot to go outside. Wow. And if they went outside, they died. And so that's five million people in various parts of the world. And, and we had seven million people last year die just from the air pollution from fossil fuels alone. So that's, that's more million. people died last year from fossil fuels than any other thing ever. And do you um, see it increasing every single year? Yes. As long as our fossil fuel use increases and production and use, then we're going to see more and more people die. And those numbers that I gave you aren't even looking at people who have lost their homes due to fires or died in fires or floods. And the number and severity of fires and floods is increasing around the world. And what's also increasing is how quickly they happen and how intense they are. Yeah. So now we can have flash floods that can bury whole buildings and people drown. We can have fires that erupt like a ball of fire and a whole city is incinerated within seconds. That happened in California two years ago and also this year in Maui. In, in Maui this year, people had to just run and jump into the ocean. So imagine you're just sitting in your apartment and all of a sudden everything's on flames around you and you just have to go jump in the ocean to survive. That's what happened in Maui this year. And and some people didn't make it. Some people were incinerated just sitting in their cars. This is because of the use of fossil fuels. That's what climate change looks like. So this is happening already on the planet now at one degree. If we get to two degrees, it will be even more than twice as bad, three degrees. And then there's also the impacts to the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So right now we know that the oceans are at least 30% more acidic than they used to be. That means fish are dying and shellfish are dying, and it's going to increase as more carbon dioxide gets trapped in our atmosphere. So that means we'll, we'll have less fish to eat as well and other yeah. things from the ocean, because as the ocean acidifies, everything dies, or as it heats up, a couple of years ago in Canada, when we had this thing called a heat dome, where it didn't get cool even at night, and it was terribly hot, a billion shellfish boiled in the ocean. It was so gross. You went down to the ocean, everything just stank. Oh. And if you went down to the beach, and all the mussels and the scallops, they just boiled. So the implications of those heat rises is that food becomes a lot more expensive because mm -hmm. some places can't grow food anymore. Even the places that can are growing a lot less. 
or there's big disasters like floods and then all the rice paddies are gone and you don't have that. And so we've already seen about a 30 in most regions, a 30% increase in the price of food just in the mm -hmm. last couple of years. Yeah. And that will just keep going up as long as climate change gets worse. And that's why this is so important because it's no longer just a moral issue. You know, we need to protect the environment. That's a nice thing to do. It is a, Survival. it is the moral challenge of our time because it is as climate change increases, the, the most vulnerable in society are hit the worst. They don't have air conditioning, so they die in the heat waves. They, they can't afford food anymore because it's gotten so expensive. And so the studies are showing that it's women, it's children, and it's the elderly that are being impacted by climate change the most. Um, but in fact, we'll, it will impact all of us, no matter how much money you have. Yeah. If you're caught in a flash flood or a fire, it impacts everyone. No, I think that's very, very helpful. Putting the picture of what's happening today and then what could get, how it could get worse in the future, right? If we can't buy food or we can't have access to food, then it's, it doesn't help, it doesn't serve us. So you talked about like, this is what's happening at one degree and this imagine what could happen at four degrees. So how do we- And we're on like, track to about 2.5, just well, so okay, you know. So we're out of all the policies around the world, then yeah. we're on track to about 2.5 right now. So we need to we need to bend that curve and we need to we need to and and we can, but it's mm -hmm. about pushing countries to to put in place more policies, more agreements to be more ambitious. And and our presidents and prime ministers will be more ambitious if they think that people care. Often mm -hmm. I meet with presidents or prime ministers or ministers and they say, well, Spore, I'm doing as much as I can because if I do more, I won't get elected next time because yeah. the opposition w is pushing against us because not enough people care about climate change. So I can't do much more than this. So that's called political space in social movement theater. We, our job as citizens has to be to give more political space. You know, women would have never gotten the right to vote. If there hadn't been people marching in the streets and chaining themselves to parliament and writing letters and saying, I, I support this, because if you support it, then our politicians will take the actions to do it. Mm -hmm. But so we need more people writing to them and calling them and marching in the street and doing everything we can to make sure that they know that this is a priority for us. Reducing fossil fuels, increasing renewable energy, ambition on climate change, it's a priority. And if they hear that, then they will will take the right steps. No, I think that's helpful. We'll make sure to link to some resources so that people can take all of these actions. Because they Yeah, you don't have report. to do it on your own. There's yeah. so many great groups out there who are working on these issues. Fossil Fuel Treaty, you can join us, stand.earth. There's going to be other environmental groups in your, wherever you're from, chapters mm -hmm. of Environmental Defense or Sierra Club or 350. There's lots of groups that you can join that will provide opportunities and information to you in order to engage in it. So we'll make sure to loop in so we can list all of these groups so that to help people to take action such that it doesn't become this big and daunting endeavor. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. So let's talk a bit more about like what programs that you started. So you started, you co-founded Stand Earth. Can you tell us a little bit more about this not-for-profit and how it's impacting the world, but also what we can do? Like, I think focusing on simple actions is powerful for the mm -hmm. audience who's trying to change the world, but doesn't want to take on like a PhD or a, a second side job. Yeah. yeah. Not everyone can do this full time. I feel very lucky that I get to do this full time, but I, I always encourage people just take an hour at the end of a day and, 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 and support somebody else's campaign. You don't have to be doing it full time to engage, but what stand on earth does, I think is really exciting. It, I think it's one of the only organizations in the world that is focused on, first of all, analyzing the data on a whole area or sector. So the fashion industry, the shipping industry, the, the forestry industry, and looking at the supply chain data. So from, from the beginning of where the extraction happens to who consumes it, and then trying to figure out what the what the best thing that area of work can, can do. So for example, let me take fashion. So mm -hmm. Standout Earth has figured out how to trace how much each company is using in terms of energy, where it comes from, what their climate policies are, but also what their material comes from. So for example, mm. Lululemon 
Um, yeah. Some of their uh, leggings are produced in factories that only use coal. Hmm. So that means they're, instead of using renewable energy, they're using coal. And Lynn Lemon's so big that if they demand, you know, more energy in a region where they're producing their leggings, say Vietnam or Turkey, then a new coal plant could be built just for the fashion industry. Mm. And that's a huge amount of pollution. But it yeah. also means these companies have big power because these companies could say, I only want renewable energy. I'll put my factory here if you make sure renewable energy is, is available for it. And in that way, the companies can change practices. So every year, Stan produces a report card that ranks all the companies. So if you're wondering, is H&M better than The Gap? Is Lululemon worse than Patagonia? You can look at the report card at Stan.Earth's website, and you can see all the fashion companies and what they do. And it, Stan will also give you an opportunity to engage. Like if the, if the campaign is against Lululemon right now, there'll be letters you can send to Lululemon or actions you can take in order to help increase the power to push them to change. So we do that on a lot of different issues, and we, we work on the Amazon, protecting the Amazon jointly with indigenous people in the Amazon. And in that campaign, we traced the money. Who's mm. investing for more oil drilling to happen in the heart of the Amazon? And we found a bunch of banks in Europe who all say they have policies for, on climate and indigenous rights and biodiversity. So they shouldn't be investing oil drilling in the Amazon. Yeah. And when we contacted those banks, they were kind of horrified. And now a whole bunch of those banks have changed their policies and pulled their money out of oil drilling in the Amazon. In fact, That's one amazing. bank, BNP Paribas, they put in place a whole exclusion zone for the Amazon in their in their financing. And so now they've moved, we estimate somewhere between six and seven billion dollars out of oil trade in the Amazon because of our research. Wow. So Stan does this really cool research on forests, on climate, a whole bunch of different sectors and really really finds cool ways for people to engage in the campaign and to help and to help push the campaigns and we're doing campaigns now all over the world so i have two organizations stand.earth and fossilfueltreaty.org mm -hmm. and we try and at both to give people all the information they need so that they can they can also organize in their own towns can you tell us a little bit more about the the fossil treaty organization, what is the goal, what the mission is, and what it's focused on, and also how we can help. Sure. So when I figured out this thing that countries and companies had been focusing on reducing emissions, but they're just allowing the production to keep growing of fossil yeah. fuels, of oil, gas, and coal, I started looking at, well, how does the Paris Agreement address this? How, it's the global agreement for countries to save the climate. How does it address it? You know, the words oil, gas, coal, and fossil fuels don't even exist in the Paris Agreement. Again, because the fossil fuel industry has been so successful in making their products invisible. So all the international agreements are predicated on this theory that renewable energy will get cheaper, which it has, mm -hmm. that we'll use less fossil fuels, which we do, and that then the markets will constrain supply, mm -hmm. which is not working. So and it hasn't worked for 30 years. Out. Yeah, with jargon, you can make it so obscure that then it protects you from accountability because nobody understands it. So it's, it becomes exactly like in the egg. Well, exactly. And I, and all, you know, the fact is the markets are totally distorted today by fossil fuel subsidies. The IMF reports that our governments are giving $7 trillion in public money to the oil companies, even though they're the most profitable companies on earth. You know what that is? $13 million a minute is being, wow given to the oil and gas companies instead of that money going into helping make food more affordable or yeah. buildings cleaner or transportation cleaner or build more renewable energy or education so, so i started wondering what kind of agreements do we need between countries so that we can quickly stop the expansion of new fossil fuel projects Mm -hmm. And I started doing research with academics from around the world, and we came up with this idea of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, modeled in part after the work that nations did to agree on how to stop stockpiling nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. created the Nuclear Non-Proliferation, um, the, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And what's interesting about it is that treaty was created with a small group of like-minded countries with high ambition and voting rules and a strong and binding treaty. And then even though some of the big countries never signed it, 
-hmm. They all started agreeing to those rules because they were the highest rules. They shifted the social norm. Stockpiling nuclear weapons used to be what kept you safe. And by the end of that campaign, the end of that treaty, it was recognized by the world that more stockpiling of nuclear weapons was what made us more vulnerable. It threatened us. That's what we have to do on fossil fuels. So we have now proposed a global fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. Mm -hmm. And you know what? A year ago, only one country backed it. Vanuatu, mm -hmm. the most vulnerable country on earth. If climate change keeps getting worse, they're going to drown. They're the so most low-lying. Vanuatu. But get this, a year later, we now have 12 countries that are backing the fossil fuel treaty including Colombia, who's a major fossil fuel producing nation. President Petro at, at this last international climate change negotiations in Dubai made this amazing speech, which you can find on our YouTube page, mm -hmm. about why Colombia was joining the fossil fuel treaty. So now there are 12 countries, but there's also over 2,000 academics, 100 Nobel laureates, over 100 cities have passed motions calling for the fossil fuel treaty. And over 3,000 organizations, including every major religious institution in the world, the World Council of Churches, archbishops, cardinals. We're even in conversation with the Vatican. So yeah. this is a huge movement now of health groups and women's groups and faith groups and cities all calling on countries to start negotiating a fossil fuel tree. That's so people amazing. can join the fossil fuel tree. You can endorse it as an individual. You can get your your your, your, your church to endorse. You could run a campaign to help get your city to pass a motion or even lobby your government. And we make all the resources available on our website. So anyone around the world can start organizing or campaigning or advocating for a fossil fuel treaty with us. That's amazing. And I love the fact that it started with one and now it's 12 countries and hopefully we're going to have hundreds in a year. Thousands. Yeah. So there's going to be more progress. So we'll make sure to link to that as well. And you're also involved in another organization, which is around illegal. You have a drone organization, which uh, monitors Ill illegal blogging. Yeah, yeah that's part of blogging. Stand Earth. That's a, that's a campaign that's part of Stand Earth, And it's a campaign that we've been looking at because, look, until we started this campaign, everyone was saying that wood pellets and bioenergy was going to be the solution to coal. And okay. in fact, a lot of countries in Europe have switched from using coal to, to wood pellets and bioenergy. And so we started wondering, well, where's the wood coming from? And, they, and the industry was telling us, oh, it's just from wood chips. It's from never hold trees. It's not really. But then when we started contacting communities in Canada, where a lot of the old growth forest is, they were like, no, they're lying. They're using whole trees. They're logging whole forests to make these wood pellets and then selling them to Europe and Japan and other countries and telling them that it's sustainable heating. They should be using heat pumps and renewable energy, but instead they're destroying what's left of the forests. Hmm. And so we decided to research it. And so we went to all the regions and they make it very secretive. It's hard to find out what's going into the plants. Mm -hmm. So we put up drones above wow. the plants so that we could take footage and see. And sure enough, Trucks were coming in with whole trees that were logged just to make these so-called sustainable wood pellets mm -hmm. out of, they said it's wood waste. It's not. They're logging forests and then making them into pellets and then saying it's cleaner and safer than using coal. But when they could be doing electrification and renewable energy and heat pumps instead. And, and so they're destroying forests. And right now we can't afford to destroy more forests. Not because anymore. Yeah. Forests are natural carbon sinks. Like a, yeah. a tree is the best technology we have yeah. because trees suck carbon out of the, the atmosphere and release oxygen. We need them in order to maintain a healthy, healthy ecosystems for humans to survive. And, you know, 80% of our old growth or frontier forests are already gone. 80%. Wow. We only have 20% left on the planet. And most of that's in three countries. Canada, Russia, and Brazil have the largest areas of forest that are left on the planet. And and so what's we need to protect those areas that we have left. And is it possible to, I mean, it takes 20, 25 years for a tree to grow. Even planting new trees is not necessarily going to go fast enough for us to turn around. 
No, we do need to plant. We do need to plant more trees. But the fact is, in some places, it takes even longer than 25 years. Some of the trees that are being logged in British Columbia, these trees are are four or five, six hundred years old. Yeah, even even older. And and so in some areas where you still have primary forests and it's slow growing, like in British Columbia, these trees are are the largest living biomass standing biomass of any place in the world so they store so much carbon it would take a whole generation and more for the trees that they're logging today to then grow old enough you know so how can we help stop the logging because i know you have drones monitoring them trying to catch companies or doing yeah, well, that. Uh, again it's about citizens engaging so stand on earth there's information on our website there's petitions you can sign Letter, draft letters so you can send your own letter to your elected official. And if you're living in a different country, you should be checking. Is my country importing these products or are they, are we, you know, is my government saying that bioenergy is renewable energy? We have to, we have to call them out yeah. and say, no, that's, that's not true. No, I think that's extremely important. hundred percent. And then when we look at, so we're going to look at Stand Up Earth, we'll make sure that we share the resources. I wanted to go into COP28 just a little bit, because I know you're coming freshly from Dubai, where there were a lot of conversations. And Yesterday. And audience going to explain what uh, COP28 is. It's the 28th conference of the parties to the United Nations Framework Con Convention on Climate Change. So it was held in Dubai on, from November 30th to December 12th. Now we're December 14th. So it was two days ago, like you're very, you're very fresh from the conference. I was looking online on your website as well, on your Facebook and all your socials. And I saw there was a lot of like hold the lines and movements from youth who were actually trying to, to, to march and, and organize around COP28 to see significant change. So I want to mm -hmm. have your perspective of like, you talked a little bit earlier about some of the positive outcomes that were done there. So how did it go? In a lot of ways, it was a historic conference of the parties after 28 of them because this conversation about fossil fuels and about how the fossil fuel industry has been trying to make their products invisible and not get any laws that constrain the production that was really broken open for the first time maybe in part because this was the first one climate negotiations that was held in an oil state like the uae mm -hmm. the president of cop that was appointed by the uae is the ceo of an oil company and so it was almost like it brought the issues into stark relief and we had different conversations i mean this was my i don't know i think i've been to 15 years of cops and, and wow. this, this one was totally different it was a real conversation about fossil fuels we made some real gains well first of all on the first day of cop they agreed to form the loss and damage fund. That's important because a lot of the countries that are experiencing the worst impacts of climate change, well, they didn't create it. Like yeah. Canada, the US, the UK, these wealthy countries have a historic responsibility because we're the ones that put the carbon in the atmosphere, the pollution. And yeah. now these, uh, these other countries in the global south are having the worst impacts. So for years, there's been this conversation about creating a loss and damage fund that the wealthy countries put money into to help the developed countries deal with the impacts of climate change. And the loss and damage fund was created. There's not enough money in it yet, but it was created. So that's a good step. It's a start, yeah. Yeah. And then the other good steps are that there was a commitment to the tripling of renewable energy and the doubling mm -hmm. of energy efficiency by 2030. Those are great targets, and I'm really glad they did it. One problem is that It was argued by many countries and many experts that they should put in the in in the agreement that we're tripling renewable energy in order to displace fossil fuels. And they didn't agree to that. And I think that's because of the influence of the fossil fuel industry, because, look, if we just build good stuff, renew, more renewable energy, but we don't commit to decommissioning and taking away the fossil fuel energy, then we just keep the pollution happening. And yeah, everybody uses more and more energy. You know, it's like, it's like, you know, it's like saying, oh, I'm, you know, I'm going to be healthy because I had a carrot juice today. I also ate four bags of chips. You, you can't. You have to eat less chips. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and so, you know, it's like someone said to me the other day, it's like they're saying, I'm still going to smoke a pack a day, but I'm also going to have a carrot juice. So I'll be healthy. 
No, it doesn't work that way. Work you, that you have way. to reduce the bad stuff too. And so we didn't get that at COP and that was frustrating. But we did get in the text a recognition for the first time that we need to transition away from fossil fuels. And I think that's a historic moment. It sends a very strong signal to the marketplace mm -hmm. and to countries that they need to start putting those policies in place. But again, the draft text had a commitment to reduce the production of fossil fuels. And the the presidency took it out of the text before it was finally signed. So that's frustrating because all these people are talking about a just transition and a transition, but they're still expanding the problem. There yeah. are hundreds new of new oil, gas, and coal projects planned around the world right now. And they haven't committed to stop expansion and then wind it down. And so that's a failure of uh, of the process. And that's, and that's why we're calling for a fossil fuel treaty. And I think the momentum for a fossil fuel treaty coming out of this COP is going to be huge because people have seen the limitations of a process where 190 countries, including the countries that stand to benefit from us not acting on climate change, yeah. those countries have to reach consensus with the other countries. And what we're designing in the fossil fuel treaty is that it would be designed by a, a group of first mover countries that create high ambition rules that are in line with the science. And, and that, and that will, that's a, that's a different model than the model that is currently happening. And I think it would be a complement to the Paris agreement. And so I think there's a lot of momentum on the fossil fuel treaty coming out of COP, but I don't think there are other major outcomes out of this, out of this conference of parties. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, but I think at least if we can drive some change with the treaty, that's one way to, to be able to drive some impact in, in that sphere. Exactly. And, and you met with a lot of presidents and, and other activists. And did you have any encounters that were transformative or exciting? Or are you going to collaborate on future projects? I did. I, a couple of things. Well, one is I met with the World Health Organization. This is the WHO is a UN body, one, mm -hmm. one of the you know, most powerful in the world on health issues. And they've endorsed the fossil fuel treaty, and they're going to help campaign and convince governments to join. So, to have a UN organization like the WHO on board, that was that's really exciting. And the and and health groups from all over the world, doctors and nurses and health organizations who are joining the treaty. I met with a lot of faith leaders, archbishops mm -hmm. and cardinals, and the World Council of Churches, and you know, a lot of faith groups are joining up to the treaty and they're and, and talking about talking to their con congregations and getting more faith leaders involved. We even started having conversations with the Holy See in the Vatican. And so wow. that was amazing. And then I would say the other most inspiring for me was Colombia. Colombia is a coal producing nation, fifth largest in the world. Their economy is 65% dependent on fossil fuel exports, and they're one of the countries that joined the treaty at COP. And not only that, but their president, President Petro, gave the most inspiring speech I've ever heard in my life. And we put yeah. it on our YouTube channel so people can look at Fossil Fuel Treaty's YouTube channel and look for Pe President Petro's speech. He was He's an amazing man. Didn't have a single note in front of him. No papers. Wow. He just sat there and he just talked and he talked about the future of the planet and how the fossil fuel treaty gives him hope. And, and he talked about how the choice we have right now is in valuing life. Mm. And if we're going to value life and living systems, then we have to be creating the policies that ensure that we're protecting life. And it was just, I don't know, it was a very poetic and just beautiful speech. I found it very inspiring. And also there's a minister that works for Colombia in, in Colombia, Minister Susanna Mohammed, one of the smartest women I've ever met and so powerful, just relentless, the whole cop and arguing against the expansion of fossil fuels. And she said, look, our economy right now is dependent on fossil fuels. We all use them, but yeah. we know every day we make the problem worse. And that's why we need to cooperate. That's why we need new, bold visions like the fossil fuel treaty. And it, like hearing her and President Petro talk about it for me as the founder of the treaty, it was mm. like, it was an amazing experience because it made me realize that it, this is not about academics and scientists now calling for this thing to happen. This thing's happening. Yeah, These countries see it as theirs and it is theirs because I can't negotiate a treaty. I'm not an elected official. Only the countries can negotiate a treaty and they're now designing it and, and the secretariat 
is now in, you know, really in service to the movements around the world, building the campaign and also the treaties who, the countries who are now starting to design this treaty. So it just felt really real and, and hopeful. To me. I mean, congratulations. I think it's exciting Thank to you. have a big win. And so if we want to have more wins, right, we want to support you in your cause. So you talked about those five countries or the biggest coal producing countries. Colombia is one of them. What are the other countries where there could be more advocacy from our audience to help support? Well, we only have 12 countries that have signed on so far. So any mm -hmm. country in the world is going to help. And there's lots of people working on the fossil fuel treaty all over the world. So our, our secretariat is there for you if you want to run a campaign in your city or in your country mm -hmm. or with your faith institution. We have a small global team of staff who work full time just helping people make sure they have the materials they need. So you can just contact us through our website. I guess I really, I really think it's important for people to make it their own. Don't yeah. think about helping us. Think about how you can run your own campaign with your own groups. And, and um, you know, I would say some of the most important countries to advocate in are the wealthy countries, U.S., Canada. UK, Norway, Australia, these countries are responsible for the majority of fossil fuel expansion in the next five years. Mm -hmm. And they're the wealthiest countries. And the wealthiest countries should be acting first because it's easier for us to yeah. stop expansion and diversify the economy into other products that don't kill us. And and so the fact that we're seeing, you know, the US is responsible for the majority of expansion right now, but Canada's not good either. So the, these wealthy countries that they're the ones expanding it right now, it's just wrong. And so they're going to need the biggest pushes because that's where the fossil fuel industry is the strongest. No, I think that's very helpful for us to know. I'm I'm based in Los Angeles, so totally. Oh, okay. I'm in the U.S., so I can definitely... Well, you should be proud. You know, your governor, Gavin Newsom, is one of the only politicians in the world that is really standing up to the oil industry. In fact, he's suing them. California as a state is suing the oil industry because they knew about climate change. They hid it from us. And then they then they then they've systematically tried to weaken the laws. And he's amassed this amazing case and he's suing the oil industry. Yeah. Yeah. And guess what? California signed on to the fossil fuel treaty, became the second state in the world to sign on to the fossil fuel treaty. So that was exciting. It's exciting. I'm I'm excited about that as well. So as we wrap up this conversation, and thank you so much for your time, um, I think we talked a lot about raising awareness about environmental issues and also mobilizing public support for conservation efforts, right? So everybody can play a, a role. And I think it's, it's been a, such a rich conversation for us, right, to understand what are the small steps we can take and working with our government officials and whatnot. And you also shared amazing achievements and milestones for the 3D, but also at COP28, which is extremely exciting and we're proud with you. I think, uh, lastly, I want to make sure that we summarize for all, everybody who's listening to us, so we talked about all the things that we can do. If we could summarize all the actions that the normal person who doesn't have a lot of time can take to be able to turn around the climate trajectory. If you want to summarize them for us and make it very, because we want to create a crisp, a video that we can relay across. Sure. It's, it is really important that we try and live our best lives, that we buy things that are reused first, that we uh, try and reduce our carbon footprint. But more importantly than that, that we write to our elected officials, that we participate in marches, that we participate in petitions, join campaigns that you care about or organizations like Fossil Fuel Treaty or Stand Dot Earth who are trying to make a difference. Because this, at this moment in history, is not just about what you buy. It's about our laws and our systems and the actions that we take today are going to save lives. So, so it's really important that we all try and make an effort. It's amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Bergman.